I have seen gods fly. I've seen men build weapons that I couldn't even imagine. Uh-huh. I've seen aliens drop from the sky. Yeah. But I have never seen anything like this. How much more are you hiding? Hola! Hello, hello, hello. This is the film board from the next reel on rashpixel.fm. We spoil movies, and tonight we are going to flip and spin and claw our way into Black Panther, the 18th movie in the official Marvel Cinematic Universe, and sandwiched right in the middle of phase three of Disney's master plan to control the weather in movie theaters near you for the rest of yours and your children's lifetimes. Our gang of thugs fanned out this week and boarded a spacey-looking hovercraft for a trip to an African country, cleverly hidden smack in the center of the continent. And we've now gathered tonight to regale you with the tales of Wakanda. So let's introduce our hosts so we can find out about their excursions. What do you remember most about the hidden homeland, Steve Sarmento? Well, I think the monarchs in the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe need to learn a little bit about infrastructure, both the King of Wakanda and the Grandmaster from Thor Ragnarok. They have really narrow streets with lots of foot traffic. Come on, there's lots of people. <laughs> Build some infrastructure. That's spoken <laughs> like an Arizonan. <laughs> How about you, Tommy? Which is the best pound by pound? Bitcoin, Vibramium, or Unobtainium <laughs> from Avatar? Unobtainium! I forgot about Unobtainium. Or the All Spark. <laughs> How, which MacGuffin is, is the most is the most weighty? And you, Pete Wright, welcome. You know what we all need? If we were together, we would have more body-slapping handshakes with one another. I think that's the, our thing for 2018. Oh. These guys here, they call me JJ, and I just can't wait for us to get into a debate at some point about the differing physical qualities of the super fictional, super hard, super substances of vibranium and adamantium. Oops, I didn't read ahead. <laughs> no, but that's okay, because I totally forgot about unobtainium, but un- unobtainium isn't particularly hard, is it? I haven't seen Avatar. Oh, no, it's hard with value. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question, of course, as the comic book guy, is who has sharper claws, Black Panther or Wolverine? Mm. Because, again, super fictional, right? Both super hard. And do Wolverine's claws, like, pierce Captain America's shield? Because that's vibranium. These are the things that keep comic book fanboys like me locked in ridiculous debates for hours. But we're not going to focus on that because on this show we talk about the movie. And you folks listening can find more details on this show about movies and all of its sibling shows about movies at thenextreel.com. Also, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at The Next Reel to get lots of our other fun movie interactions on the interwebs. The way to maximize your movie multifecta with us is to support The Next Reel on Patreon and get access to our show's drafts feed along with other special ways to connect and chat with us beyond this podcast itself so check it out it's at patreon.com slash the next reel all right let's get in and marvel this thing up let's start with your initial thoughts uh pete how about you what'd you think Uh, i was very excited about this movie this i i think i said so long ago that of all of black of uh, marvel's upcoming slate this is the thing i had been most excited to see uh and i think the first two-thirds of the film really uh delivered i uh the the quiet moments were the moments that i think were most uh most beautiful and most interesting and uh the things that that I think it was clear that the filmmakers wanted to do with Black Panther and the last third of the movie uh, represented what they the, the thing the, the list of boxes they had to check uh, mm-hmm. because they are part of the Marvel Universe and sure. uh, mostly I was in a delirium thinking about Tommy the whole time how is he possibly going to manage talking about the last third of this movie with all of the <laughs> fake things fighting fake things <laughs> it is just magnificent <laughs> Well, how about that, Tommy? How did the fake things fighting fake things uh, sit with you? Oh, that end? I mean, that was like a hobbit riding another hobbit. Let's just put that aside <laughs> for now. Um, I went in uh, with low expectations because I'm not a Marvel or uh, superhero guy, as we all know. Uh, but then, unfortunately, those got sort of mitigated by the fact that the hype was so big. What I can say is I really did respect and enjoy a lot of this film. Most of the things had nothing to do with superheroes. I really liked a yeah. lot of the stuff and the superhero stuff kind of in a slight way getting um, uh, along with what Pete was saying. The superhero stuff really got in the way for me, but we can go into that later. So I was okay 
about the movie. Okay. That's a, that's a good place for you to be, I think, coming into a Marvel movie. How about you, Steve? What did you think? Well, I went in with, you know, no expectation since I hadn't seen any of the trailers. So I just really didn't know what to expect other than the typical Marvel fair. But I was really pleasantly surprised because this is the movie that Thor should have been. I mean, when we, we're, we've got a really compelling story about you mean thor one when you say that right the first yes thor? well yeah i think even the thor arc over the you know the three of them because this is really about how you know the role of a, a leader you know assuming the throne and his responsibilities to his people as being a leader of those people and hmm. his nation and the challenges and it, it really delved into that and there were no sky beams destroying the universe this was really <laughs> confined to wakanda and what was going on there and it built that world, got us into it, and gave me a, a great thrill ride. It gave me all the the light comic moments I expect from a Marvel movie. It gave me all the big, you know, battles. It hit all the points. I had a great time with this. Well, that's awesome. It sounds like we all had a generally positive feeling about it for me. It, for me, it was... Uh, it, it really felt like a traditional three act structure. I, I don't know that I've seen a Marvel movie where I can really pick out the turns for each of the acts. And that was really interesting to me because I feel like they, they dealt with the execution of those three acts in a unique way in something that hasn't been done in, of, uh, in other Marvel movies, particularly uh, the early kill off of the claw character. Uh, and then the whole nature of what happens after that being enclosed in Wakanda. And now you have, instead of expanding the universe as we go through the story, it actually came a little bit closer close, closer in. And I felt like that made it more easily dis- digestible as a standalone movie. So that might actually connect to what you're talking about, Tommy. And then the, for a big hit for me, and I don't think we usually talk about this enough, is that it was hugely different music. And it was a really there were really powerful music cues for me that were so different from any other Marvel movie out there. Did you guys have any points that you found when you were watching this? Steve, I like the contrast that you make to the Thor universe. Did you find any other uh, things that you found were particularly unique about this in the whole, you know, space of Marvel movies that are out there? Well, you know, I think what's interesting about this one is that it, it really is a celebration. I think that, uh, Ryan Coogler and, and Joe Robert Cole and, and the, the whole team, they, they came together to really show us something that was, a, a really truly culturally different uh, you know uh, film in this Marvel universe and and there's so much I know that I just don't and can't understand uh, because I don't have a sense of the history and uh, the the uh, sort of cultural development of the you know African nations and I feel like I'm missing a lot of the punch but I still was so deeply rewarded by uh, the color and shapes and decorations and the makeup and the the sort of the the nods to the tribal uh, you know histories and uh, and how they used all of that to root the technology and uh, the design of the of of the you know the James Bond table walk you know the the sand table I mean some of the gadgets in here we've just not seen before uh, and and I I really appreciated that I think the production design was truly exemplary in this film. Yeah, I agree. And you you brought up color. Color was a big thing for me in this film because I get frustrated lots of times in action films when I cannot tell who the different sides are. And one of the things that's inherent to this film as they divide the five tribes of Wakanda up is that you learn exactly what each faction is kind of representing, what, what they're coming into. And when they are battling, you have a very clear sense of who is fighting whom and 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 basically what what side is is the, what side you can support in it. I really appreciate appreciated that i think that made for a very attractive and powerful movie especially from an action perspective even the, even in the big the big battle at the end you know where where it was uh uh girls versus boys <laughs> which i actually yep. thought was fantastic i don't know i don't know why uh the the warriors are broken up that way they're the, the king's guards are all the the women and they're decked out in their specific kind of armor and then uh all of the other soldiers have their fantastic blankets that look like great decorations until they hold them a certain way and they become those giant energy shields that was awesome and they can call the rhino brigade which was so cool <laughs> it's uh, classic I, wakanda I, Right. It was classic <laughs> Wakanda. Uh, and, and so that, those elements, I think, where they, uh, again, they're, they're tying in the sort of cultural history with, uh, uh with, with the, the tech and the big battle scenes, I thought was a real gift for this movie. Yes. To jump on along that, especially for someone who, as aforementioned, does not care for fake things on fake things. 
the aesthetic of the movie was the most thrilling for me. Um, the fact that they didn't thaw it out, the fact that they were, that we've been told over and over again, yes, it's hidden in Africa, but it's this incredibly technologically advanced city. They could have tomorrow landed. They could have gone wherever they wanted and made it a bunch of candy coated nonsense. Like for me, Thor's homeworld is. I think that's called Norad. I don't know. Asgard. Asgard. Whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Torrance. Having grown up like blocks away from Norad, I have a real problem with that joke. <laughs> those opening shots of seeing those uh, magnetic trains flying through, and then also there's graffiti on the walls and you're walking through there. The characters are walking through a traditional African bazaar uh, while also these in the background, these amazing sort of things are happening. That is such a smart and grounding way to do it. I'm just sort of piggybacking on your guys thoughts about saying that to make it um, culturally re relevant and recognizable. That was my most favorite thing about this. I've never wanted to hang out in a, a future city that doesn't exist more, especially in any of these Marvel movies, more than I ever have than this city. This city breathed life. It feel, felt real. It felt lived in and not this weird, shiny toy that doesn't make sense to me. I loved that so much. I, I Tommy, I, I, I don't want to. This is just a love fest of Wakanda. But I, I think that to your point, that also made the characters relationship to each other and to the space so much more powerful. When he was walking, when the king of Wakanda, when T'Challa is walking through the, the city, he feels like a part of it and not, uh, you know, not a a vaunted ruler he feels like a, like a living breathing member of this community and and that is a new feeling uh, in right. these movies and not just walking past i mean there yeah. was a lot of green screen problems for me in this movie especially during the action scenes we can get into that later but some of that stuff being able to have real practical sets and then have the more futuristic stuff going on in the background that makes all the difference to me i loved it well and i think i, I think that goes back to steve's point too about it kind of being a, a a superior to the the story and production design for the thor arc in that it the design works in a way that it brings everyone in and then it actually interacts with the characters in a better way too i think that you guys are both saying that it, one of the notes that i listed here in in what we were going to run down is the the parallels to the wonder woman woman story and narrative and i can't remember what's the name of their uh, fictional land that's hidden from the world delamo it's themiscira the island. Yes. Thank you. What's the mascara? That's where Wonder Woman's from. Oh, okay. And forgot. The interesting thing is that the story is very, very similar to the Wonder Woman story in that they're hiding away. Of, of course, it's not technology in, in the Wonder Woman story, but it's that they have the power to save the world. Right. And they're hiding it because that because the, the humans, the uh, you know, the other folks on the planet uh, are can't can't handle it. They're going to destroy themselves. Um, and I think that, you know, you get into the Wakanda story and they're saying that that's kind of the whole pull of this story. Right. Is that we have the ability to to liberate our people all over the world. But we're we're holding on to it here so that we can protect Wakanda, which I think is really interesting here. I, I love Wonder Woman as a movie. I think it's it's fantastic. But I actually like this movie more because I think this movie is more approachable. I think this movie is does a better job of bringing in the audience to it as opposed to setting the audience apart from what the story is going on. Did any of you guys feel any Wonder Woman polls when you were watching this movie? Yeah, I mean, isn't that part of of the role of Black Panther as a character, right? I mean, it, it Black Panther is sort of a, a, a as a superhero is a celebration of uh, a marginalized group in the in this form of media, and so is Wonder Woman in in some way, shape, or form, right? It's ta it, they they both have taken on this uh, this mantle of lifting up. Uh, and and building power around a group that is marginalized uh, that has been marginalized in the media and and beyond uh, uh, you know and I, I think that's uh, to me that's a that's a, a really powerful parallel the, to me that I, I see the parallels in sort of setting up these heroes but what's totally different in the story that we're told in Black Panther that I find really compelling is this story really focuses on the relationship between the king and his land and his people whereas wonder woman is about her sort of discovering her own identity and going out into the world for here it's really rooted in wakanda and the internal struggles within wakanda between the tribes you know an outsider that comes in 
that there you have so much more of a sense of his relationship to his people than you have between Wonder Woman. You've got sure in the beginning of that, you've got a relationship with her mom, and but you don't really get a, a chance to know a lot of the other Amazons. Here we've got a, a large supporting cast that we see around him, supporting him. It's not just him going off. He's always got his general by his side. The, it, he doesn't go into you know, on his own, he's always got his support team. And it's a completely different dynamic that I really appreciate because it it's really setting up that leader does, is not out there to save the world on his own. He needs these people. And it's a very different story from Thor as well. We don't see a strong connection between Thor and the regular people or other. He's got his small band of friends that, you know, disappeared after the second movie. We don't really see them anymore. Here, it's really uh, ensemble, and I think it worked really, really well. We had a lot of world building to get accomplished right up front, and I think they did it with great economy. I knew who everybody was and what their roles were and could get right into the story. You know what I, to your point, Steve, one of the things I think is so interesting is that of his coterie, uh, we have uh, the people he, he relies on and counts on the most. Um, there, there are, I think, six, uh, people, maybe seven if you count, uh, Martin Freeman as token. Um, but we have, uh, uh you know, the old man, the mentor figure is killed. Uh, and we have, uh, Daniel Kaluuya, who is the betrayer and the, f- the other four major characters that he counts on the most for counsel and direct military assistance are incredibly strong women. And I thought that was stunning. Every time they worked together and he t- spoke to them as peers and equals and they it was it was just fantastic. And that's what I mean, like the quiet moments in this movie where you get to see those relationships made the rest of the film so much more entertaining for me. It was written well and it was performed extremely well. The the relationship that he had with his sister in particular I thought was really special and the way that they interacted throughout the film felt so at ease and so perfect for that sibling relationship. I I thought it was really powerful and and I totally agree with you, Pete. I think the quiet moments are what make this movie stand out as a superior film. It's towards the top of the heap for the Marvel movies for me. It's It's not the best comic book movie from the Marvel Cinematic Universe in my opinion, but it's definitely more on the high side in my opinion. Uh, so you mentioned people that were killed off right away, uh, Pete, um, people that were killed off that you didn't expect to be killed off. Uh, w- one of the major kudos that I want to give the film is how little it revealed in the trailers. And of course, Steve, you didn't watch it at all, but there's so, I, I can say there's so many stars in this movie, right? There's so many people that when you find out that the, the end of the resolution of the first act is killing Andy Serkis, I thought that was a huge a, a huge boon to the movie. I thought the fact that the the trailer just was hype. It just got you excited about what was going to be in the movie, and then you came and the story unraveled in front of you. I was very impressed by that, and I was and a movie that I kind of expected to know the formula coming in. It surprised me with every turn. That's a really good point, especially about Andy Circus. I was waiting for him to be the bad guy, and was sort of okay with him, but he was so one note crazy which i think he was written to be which is fine i was really glad to see him be taken away as like because he see he sort of came off as like a joker's henchman versus like a real (laughs) fully formed bad guy and that would have been tough to watch him for the entire time so no i agree with that oh yeah as soon as uh because i figured oh you know we we'd been introduced to you know claw and you know one of the other uh, Marvel film. So I thought, oh, okay, that this is now we get to see this, you know, big battle between Black Panther and, and Claw. And then as soon as he gets taken out, and then we see Eric Killmonger, you know, dragging that bag across, you know, as he's entering into Wakanda, I thought, oh, this just got interesting because the whole dynamic was, you know, Chal has got a, his whole thing to prove himself a strong leader is he's got to deal with claw and the fact that he was unable to do it now we've got this you know outsider coming in who is delivering what the people have been begging for for 30 years and i thought oh this dynamic got really interesting for me i think so I too. if i can let you know what it's like to live in my head while we were watching this movie i was not able to see it with uh our friend of the show darnell dash smith who is my marvel hand holder for all of these things um so I saw it uh, with friends, but more or less by myself. And when you talked about the other people that he gets, um, that the, I'm sorry, Chala, who's the main character? 
T'Challa. Mm-hmm. T'Challa. T'Challa uh, gets counsel from is also Forrest Whitaker is up there in addition to the females. And when Forrest, Forrest Whitaker showed up, <laughs> me being me, I went, oh, right. Because he was in that movie before. And what was he? And wait, he used to have to have a breathing device. And why was that? <laughs> but I thought he died. Oh, well, now, then I realized I was both thinking about Battleship Earth and that Star Wars movie that he was in. Wait. And I was like, oh, no. And then I think I passed out. But I woke back up and I was back in it to win it. But that's what it's like to be me. No, because I can't keep my fantasy uh, people. So I just I conflated everything and then it all worked out. So back to the real conversation. Oh, man, I am so sad for you, Tommy. I really am. You so shouldn't you, be because it's such an Star adventure. Wars. It's such an <laughs> adventure to be me. It's like I'm the memento guy. Every fu- every That's five true. minutes in these movies, I'm like, what? Is this a new character? This is exciting. <laughs> so then you were really confused why why Bilbo Baggins was flying a spacecraft. Then I, I guess that was also I was so confused. You, right? I was like, I assumed he was going after a dragon. It's all going to work out, guys. It's all going to work out. Well, what I wanted to say was to point at uh, Steve's bringing up of when Killmonger drags in Claw in the body bag. That was a that was an awesome, powerful scene, especially when you consider that Wakanda is this hidden place and you've already been set up so well with Daniel Kaluuya's desire for revenge. And you see the sort of political motivation that's going to bring that's going to bring him to back to Wakanda. It's it just such a powerful and, and shot really well too. That was one particular shot that I loved. Another shot that I loved in the, in, in the film was when, uh, when I can't remember if it was, whether it was when Killmonger took the throne or whether it was when black Panther took the throne, but how they started the, the camera upside down. That was when Killmonger took as, it. Cause the, the world was turned upside to the down. Throne, I loved it. Right. And as he walked to the throne, the, the camera actually rotated and slowly got closer and closer, but never got fully straight up. Like that, that was and just the music super was perfect cool. with that. That was such a great yeah. practical way of showing you that the world had changed and stuff. Versus, I felt disoriented yes. and like, and you had already been set aside by what he had done in the in the the duel. I mean, just g- great stuff and that kind of stuff. That really showed a lot of the style of this film. That you're you're talking about the practical effects right in the first and second acts. So we can. We can talk about the, the the less practical effects that come later in the film, but that kind of stuff I really liked. And, you know, Ryan Coogler, that, as director of this film, one of the things that he's known for is Creed. And and Creed was also uh, Michael B. Jordan. And you think the style that comes from that film, I think, surprised everyone. I think Creed hit people a lot harder than they expected when they saw it. And I think he was the right person to attach to this movie. I think he gave it a style and a substance that made it a much a much more interesting film than it could have been if it just fell into the 18th slot in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. What else did you guys see from Ryan Coogler and, and the rest of the folks on direction and camera in this movie? I just have one more point on on uh, sentiment, di- direction and sentiment and the message that I, I sort of took away from this. I think it was really smart and and resonant and timely that the, the narrative is kind of a celebration of false choices uh, in Wakanda. What Wakanda is going through is their internal struggle, right, where you, you have to Chala, who's uh, saying, you know, close the borders. We're protectionists. We protect our people. We want, we want a, a wall bigger and higher. You know what I mean? That's that's sort of the right. we're going to stay hidden. We're not right. going to mess with any of this stuff. And then you have uh, Carol, Killmonger come in, who is politically antithetical to that message, which is we're going to send weapons to the people, and we're going to rise up, and we are going to arm the world and and take it back. We're going to be the strongest uh, military power on the planet. We are going to be the strongest. So you have protectionist. And you have military strength, and actually, those are false choices. And that's what the—that's the overall lesson of the movie at the end, which is, you right. know what, we have a lot to offer, and we can do it smartly. You know, we can pol- we can be politically active and visible on this planet and contribute, and we can do it in a way that is uh, that is balanced and even-handed and not damaging to our people. And so, for me, like that dance between those false choices, uh, make what. 
Wakanda great again and you know uh, oh my gosh close the borders <laughs> like there there is a uh, it, it, there was a real power to that and by the time it ended I found I, I felt like I sort of was able to let go of my breath you know I'd been holding my breath a little bit um, uh, you know, logically uh, so when they said you know this is going to be our uh, we're standing on the site where our father killed our uncle and this is going to be the Wakanda out- Outreach Center and you're going to run the science How great was that? Uh, that was yeah. just a, a really beautiful beautiful moment uh in, in this movie and i think it's watershed for the series i think this is this is uh, uh, you know i i think it's actually going to going to be much more interesting to have black panther in this universe you know entertainment weekly actually came out and said that well number one they thought that this was the marvel movie for people who did, don't like marvel movies and secondly they said that this is going to change the way that people watch marvel movies after this and I think that it sounds like a bold statement before you see it, but after you see it and for exactly the reasons you're talking about, Pete, I, I, I agree with it. I think, you know, you think about that first toss away smile in the first cut scene when you have him standing before the UN and they say, can you tell us what, you know, an, a, a subsistence agrarian country is going to be due to, to help the, the, the technology and the, and the thriving nature of the rest of the world. And he just smiles. That's a great point to show that you know if we work together and we work together the right way we can we can accomplish amazing things i think it's a really powerful statement as well i also like that it's very very timely but not a one-to-one kind of situation like he brought up it's two false choices right it's not necessarily on the nose not necessarily on the nose is the better way to say it yeah that that it's still it it still is involved with the complexity and not just an anti so you could you could make it an anti-trump argument but it's not a definite anti-Trump argument. It's just a, a way that any kind of big civilization should hopefully want to share with other people in the right way. Well, and the the, the act of wrestling is the act of governance, and this is much more an anti-politician uh, film than you know for much of it than it is a um, you know anti one party or another. But uh, I think it I think it handles this very smartly and interestingly that that T'Challa himself as a character, you know, he goes he bounces around between having powers and then drinking the juice and not having powers and then having powers again and drinking it and not having powers. And uh, you know, I think in it, the the dance between his humanity and having to face the challenges of uh, you know the the con- the the waterfall fight challenges uh, as uh, as an unpowered man and kind of losing uh, it is a big deal right that that it turns out he has to be vested with a certain amount of p- this political we'll call mantle uh, that is represented by the the cowl and the suit and all that in order to exercise his leadership and without it yeah he can be beat but it turns out that the right person with the right gifts actually can can uh, you know lead uh, like a hero politically you know and not yes and my favorite line in the entire movie and i'm paraphrasing i don't know if i'm getting it was it's very hard for a good man to be king oh yeah yeah i think that's an amazing line that line is like a historical line (laughs) that's up there for me with uh with great power comes great responsibility it's hard for a good man to be king because those two things aren't necessarily simpatico at all in order to keep being one and then be a good the other. I loved that so much. And it made the final moment between T'Challa and Killmonger so powerful, right? When oh, they're wasn't standing that great? There in this sunset. Oh. I, I just, it was beautiful. And, uh, you know, it, it, it made that sort of recognition that, yeah, I, 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 I see that we have differences and I know I can't be around. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to die right now because we're never going to agree, but we're, we're going to, I'm going to die with respect. Uh, I thought that was really powerful yeah, and executed perfectly. The, the non superhero parts were the best parts. Yeah, again, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, this is so much about what it means to be a good leader because you you have even within the tribes of Wakanda, there's you know you've got the challenger Mbaku. You know, we've got our first fight, but when they need when an outsider comes in and threatens the nation, they can turn to him for help because together they are still the nation. They may not always agree. Because they are the they are the ones that have separated themselves, but still together they can be united as a nation to fight this outside threat, and have 
disagreement about things, but still be united. And that is something that's powerful to s- that they are willing to say, no, we, we recognize him as our king and we will support him. Uh, because, you know, it was, I was so glad they, they underplayed that moment of, okay, they're offering him, you know, the, pur- the purple glow flower. And it's like, okay, he could take that and become all powered up, but he's like, no, I'm going to show you something. And look, look what one of our, one of our fishermen found in the river. Here is your King. And to step aside, I mean, there's so many great moments like that. And then as you, know, you talk about the final moments between Chala and, and Killmonger, to, they just fought to the death and he's, you know, turns and says, I, we, we still may be able to heal you. This wasn't about just destroying the enemy. It was about saving the nation. And there was that moment where I thought, is he, is his compassion going to be able to turn Killmonger to say, Hey, you, you were wrong and, but you can still be part of, of Wakanda. And is so different from the I'm good, you're bad, we're going to fight, and ultimately one of us will be destroyed. This was a completely different story. The relationships between these characters are are so rich and deep. When people talk about why this is, you know, one of the the greatest, you know, Marvel movies, and everybody's you know talking about the box office, it's because it is about the people. It's not about sky beams and you know some b- bigger, more abstract good versus evil. This is about relationships between people and how we function as a society. And and the more that we talk about this, and the more that you know, I this sort of simmers in. I just saw you know early this evening. There's so much. It's I'm looking forward to going back and revisiting this because it's such a great place to be, but I love all of these characters so much. Yeah, I think I'm going to see it again in the theater. And I think, you know, what you guys are talking about, I, I completely agree with the grace, the graceful execution of the way that they depicted the honor within this culture was just fantastic. So, I mean, I, I, I actually think I'm probably going to go see it on Monday for President's Day. I think um, I, w- I was very, very impressed with the way that they executed all that stuff. And, and, and every single performance, not just characters, but there wasn't a single weak performance in this thing. Everybody on screen was strong and beautiful and powerful and interesting and compelling and was designed well. Like I and the accents worked, you know, you have this vague sort of African nation <laughs> Wakandan accent that I totally bought into. Uh, you have uh, my Andy Circus is always just crushing it with his accents. Martin Freeman's American accent was right on the money. Like I just. I bought every element of this thing, every single one. I got to be honest, I found Martin Freeman uh, distracting. Really? I'd, wh- why put Martin Freeman in that role as an American? Just, just know all I'm thinking about is trying to hear his normal voice. All I'm doing is just sort of like judging his accent. There's just, I don't understand the reason for why pick him. I I don't know I don't know why but what, are you judging it because you do, you uh, didn't like legitimately didn't find it believable I because I was able to let go and I thought he sounded great maybe it's maybe it's more about me is the whole time I was waiting to see if it faltered yeah and I just don't the idea of just sort of randomly putting British in American or American in British things is just always sort of puzzling to me especially British into American um because there wasn't a lot of heavy lifting for that. And the humor was something that did not work for me, mostly in this film. So but, you're basically happy that you you aren't happy that they Brit washed the CIA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, can I, at some point we do have to talk because it's it is becoming very much a love fest, which is great because there are those great things, but there are some very not great things, at least for me, about this movie. Well, let's hear it. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the action sequences. Um, most of the action sequences still, um, they would always start practically, which I loved, but then would always involve the same. Am I, are really, are people really thrilled by the shot, shot from above of someone in slow motion with this later kind of matrixy green screen stuff, jumping onto a car, flying around with the camera being able to fly around while you fly around a pole in a magnetic train. Just all of these action sequences are so distancing to me. Yeah. And I just immediately get so bored and unhappy 
almost immediately. I like the, and even the style, there's style involved and there's a thought involved. And then they go too far. They do that Peter Jackson, this is just for me talking. They do that because you can doesn't mean you should thing of, well, because he's going to probably in real life in with wire work flew around a pole and came back. But faking it, we can then send the camera with him around it, which is an impossible shot, which immediately looks fake to me. I I don't understand this kind of action work. This is the one of the biggest problems I have with the Marvel Universe is just the basic, the way that we are shooting. DC is, of course, way more complicit. But the way that we're shooting these superhero things, isn't it better to always know exactly what you're looking at and just to be to make it seem like this could happen in a real in real time. I don't I, I, I don't think they think it's possible to do that, which I think that would be a really interesting challenge to approach. I mean, I, I and I'm, I'm sure I've been excited about an action sequence since this, but I'm trying to think back to the action sequences that I'm thinking of that 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 appear superhuman that are shot practically. And I think about crouching tiger hidden dragon well but i mean like like and and i remember watching that in the theater when i saw that movie and just like it it was like a roller coaster for me because i was present in in the scene with the actors as they were doing what they were doing and i agree with you i didn't the the uh, i i think the concept of shooting a car chase and flipping exploding cars is the the idea of the excitement of that is I would assume it's being able to project yourself as an audience member into the experience that the Black Panther is experiencing. I would definitely like to hear from Pete and Steve if you disagree with this, but I, I never get there on this, on that kind of stuff because I'm, it's, it's more that I'm being distanced. I'm watching it as a spectacle as opposed to being able to participate. Well, I, I guess one of the things that I always keep in the back of my mind with any of these superhero movies is whether or not to a certain extent, they're trying to recreate what the visual experience of reading a a comic book or graphic novel is and the way some of those shots are framed and set. And I, I mean, I think that there was, I think it was the first Iron Man. There's a, there's a shot when he's like in the middle East and there's a tank or something. And just the way he's like framed off to the right third of the frame, like, Oh, I can totally see this. And you know, there's the whole, you know, Avengers where they're all sort of like lined up. There's so many times I've seen, moments where I'm like, that's the cover of a comic book. That's the two page spread. And so I think what I always go with is when we're, yes, we're like uh, vertically, like looking down on black Panther as a car is exploding. I'm like, that's the frame from the action sequence in the, in the comic book. And I go along with that because as you know, a reader of comic books, that's the fun thing as an illustrator, you can put your camera wherever. And in the most ridiculous places, the challenge with film is we have to get the camera to that position for the frame of that shot. And then we have to move out of that. And that may create some issues of, you know, Tommy's well, just because you can, should you, but I think sometimes it's to, to get that sort of shot. That's the typical expected, you know, that's what we want. Uh, so I, I embrace that and, and go with it because I know that I'm being manipulated and I, I just, go along with it uh, because I can capture those few frames and go, that was all for that moment there. And I'm willing to go along with it because to me, the reward of that frame shot sometimes is rewarding enough for me. Well, I like that explanation for it. I, um, I, I I definitely have seen that in other comic book movies too. So what you said about going in and out of it is very interesting to me because maybe I'm too latched into the full scene versus being doing whatever it takes to uh, um, doing whatever it takes to capture those amazing moments. It's the pulling in and out, which makes me feel which, which all just screams fake to me and takes me out of it in a way that instead of being able to enjoy that amazing moment, like you are, I'm instead of looking at the context, which is like, I don't care anymore. Yeah. And I think your comparison to Peter Jackson is, is, is apt, but in this case, a little bit unfair. I can't, I I can't say it any better than Steve did, right? This sort of honoring the comic book is, is the excuse that they have in these comic book movies to, to do these kinds of things, to capture the frame, to use whatever tools you can to honor the source material. 
Peter Jackson was not honoring the source material when <laughs> right. he did some of the things that he did in that movie. He was honoring himself uh, right. in those movies. And so, you know, in this case, I, I, I find that when I'm in the movie, when I'm sitting there and I've got my popcorn and my kids are next to me and it goes into these explosive sequences, uh, I, I am thinking more about just the, the excitement of the moment. It, I'm, I, it didn't take me out of the movie in this case, but I, I did find, you know, as I've, said before i i just found the stronger moments were the moments that that were the, the the quiet ones and not the big explosive ones these were a means to an end and we have to have them and they were they were fun frolicking sort of examples of of a team of special effects uh, you know artists doing great work so let's I, I just let that be that and and i guess i would say i don't think we need to have them I think that too many too many special effects people like we talked about this a bit in Guardians of the Galaxy too, of or wait I think was that the podcast that I fritzed out on either way the <laughs> the the scene in every one of these movies where there are two superhero people flying through the air punching each other while flying or recently falling through the air which happened in this movie punching and punching and the cameras kind of zooming in and out. I honestly ask, is anyone feeling anything? I don't, I posit they are not. I posit that this has become an incredibly expensive thing that maybe Hollywood thinks we love, but we don't. We're waiting for the impact. We're waiting for things to get literally more practical, get down onto the earth and have a slug out, have someone hit their head against a wall, something because I just so much of the these kind of fight machines and, and I will back off after this. I apologize. But so many of these fight sequences, I think, have become shorthand. And I honestly, just because it's so distancing for me, I don't with the people around me. And when I've seen it with friends, no one's leaning in or going, oh, at that point, I feel like isn't everyone kind of bored about some of that stuff? Flying through the air, punching? There is a massive audience that you are not accounting for. And that audience is sitting next to me in this theater. And they are 11 and 15 years old. And they were absolutely leaning in to those big moments. And they have to account for this, this different, I, you know, I'm, I, I might be with you on, you know, I, I can't stand the falling through the air. It looked like a, like two gumbies that were stop motioning, like, throwing themselves around in the air it was not great but i tell you my kids were on the edge of their seats for those sequences so you can't you just can't discount that huge audience they are not bored fair enough i might have a thesis to deliver about something about this at some point well you but know no, i, I, I but, but i, I want to defend i i have yeah. to defend your your thesis here because when you with probably still one of my very favorites of the entire series which is the the winter soldier and it is in large part because they didn't do that right it was much more of a uh you know the, the fight scenes were much more grounded and fisty and you know yeah they threw the the shield around and it bounced off of stuff but you know what we didn't get that gumby feeling in in winter soldier like i did in this movie and the sure. airport sequence and i just which yeah, one well, was that? And that that was civil war that was civil um, war yeah that was incredible i thought all of that fight scene was incredible there was a lot of gumby for me in that fight scene i felt like there was still a lot of digital but it was it was much more character based but i would say yeah. like i still have this curiosity uh, you know what would it have been like if there was a black panther movie that was grounded like the born identity you know that had right. that level that's what of, i want yes. i want i want a john wick but with superhero yeah. powers Keep the yes, camera down right. on the ground. Just right. show that's us so practical. Much to ask. That's and, but that's and for all I. Characters that's like what I want. The Black Panther, like Daredevil, yeah. like Batman, like you know the the rumored Moon Knight when it comes out. Yeah. Those are the movies where you have the opportunity to do that because they have the kind of powers where you don't have to gumby it. Yeah, they have the kind of fight scenes that you can do the martial arts you can do wires you can do practical things that make things look great because it's been done before and you should infuse it into this universe daredevil on netflix the first season of yes. daredevil had some of the most breathtaking action scenes i'd ever seen and they might as well have been the hallway fight scene oh my god insane yeah insane yeah. but i guess yeah. it, maybe that doesn't work as much if you have a magic hammer or a heat vision or a magical sponge or whatever all these characters have. I get it, but there's still, I still think that there's ways I would like to say, and I promise I will let it go right now, but that I think that even with the flying through the air stuff, the people are still really waiting for it to get down to earth. 
And when you're down to earth and it's more practical, ironically, that is what is more shocking and exciting for us now because CGI took us so far the other way. I think we really are looking for a grounding for all of these action scenes. Yeah. And you know what's interesting about that? The sequence before they fall, immediately before they fall, right? Where we have my, uh, Killmonger and he's, uh, you know, taking on the sister and the, and, and, uh, Denigria, uh, uh, Okoye. That, that was a fantastic bit of fighting. And even though they were doing things that were significantly enhanced by visual effects, uh, it, it still was it, like the Civil War scene we're talking about. It was Punches grounded in those landed. characters. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, very I, much I so. totally agree with you. I really do. I, I, okay. on, on those points. So we're in violent agreement, I think we, we call it. <laughs> I agree with you more. <laughs> but no, you are you are right to always remind me uh, that it's that I am not the I am not I'm not the demographic nor the person for these movies. And so I shouldn't think that I am the one that knows how that should be fixed. Of course not. I just know I guess I just really love saying the same thing over and over again. JJ, back to you. <laughs> well, I think we've talked about through all of this, we've talked about pretty much all of the performances in the film. There's a couple that we haven't talked about in specific, and one of them is Lupita Nyong'o, um, which I actually really liked her role in this. Um, she played Nakia. Um, what did you guys think of of Lupita's performance? Oh my God, she was so beautiful, and I can't help but think like I I, I was so bummed uh, watching this movie and then thinking about her role getting so dramatically cut from you know Star Wars stuff. Uh, obviously, she was you know playing a CG character, but I just thought she was great. Uh, I and I I can't help but want to see her in more stuff and actually so i i loved her too and you know my favorite actress my favorite performance in the entire film was letitia wright oh my gosh who's yes. that she was she was the best so she's the sister she's the sister the oh the one from yeah. black mirror yeah 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 she was so fantastic i could the entire movie i was like who is she who is she who is she and then i looked her up and i was like right my favorite episode of black mirror right okay got it yeah and i she every time she was on screen i was focused on her when we first meet her oh. when t'challa comes back <laughs> from retrieving nakia it, it, i couldn't stop looking at her she was fantastic she was so uh, dynamic and uh, effusive i just I, I, I wanted to see what she was going to do every time she was on screen. I, I loved everything she did in this movie. I thought she was saddled with some tough humor, though. How did how did the humor work for you guys in your theater? I know that humor sometimes is a it very was a huge group experience. Huge Almost all of the humor theater. busted in my theater. Like it was just oh, a really crickets. weirdly. And, uh, and oh, I was no. surprised. But that's because you're in L.A. Everybody's everybody's hearts are dead there. <laughs> you know, I oh. did go to the Dead Hearts Theater. Up on oh, is that there might have been related to that? No, yeah. yeah, my theater was extremely animated. Like, and and it super increased my enjoyment of the film. the The biggest hit that happened in my theater was when she pointed out his sandals. Oh and, yeah, and he oh, brought yeah. his feet up. Like with the, the what like, are those? Rolled. That's so yeah. interesting because okay. my theater was crickets. <laughs> and if anyone's going to know that meme, it'll be Los Angeles people. And it was crickets, and that actually hurt my enjoyment of that. Yeah. Well, no, Tommy, did you go to the, the, were you in with the young LA crowd or were you with the old, tired, grumpy LA crowd? I went to the dead, the dead heart theater <laughs> on sunset. Yeah. They show it in black and white and it's silent. <laughs> exactly. There's just, there's just an accordionist play. They insert title cards. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. About every 35 okay. seconds. There you go. Yeah. yeah. See, that's a, that's yeah. one that I think depends on the age demographic and, that's the great thing about an audience. Well, the great and, you know, unfortunate thing you can get in with, depending on the mix of your audience can really, especially with comedy, there's, you can have things that fall flat because they're like, I don't get it. Or it's targeted right to that demographic and they get it and they eat it up and it just fills the theater with energy. I think it was just sort of weird luck of, or bad luck of the draw with mine. Mine at the, at the Arclight Sherman Oaks, they're showing it every 15 minutes. Yeah. Wow. They, they, so the was entire like theater is gone, <laughs> except for all of them are showing black. And so every 15 minutes. So, yeah, I, I'm sure that we just had prisoners in our, I mean, every 15 <laughs> minutes, we got homeless people and prisoners. And I don't know who we had, but yeah. Oh. Okay, good. I'm glad that, that, that I didn't, I couldn't tell if the humor was, it was busted huge just in my theater. When I or say that general. that particular joke was rolling, it yeah. was the kind of thing where I didn't hear the lines. 
Yep. It was that big. That was that was mine too. They th- when she said, "What are those?" and then immediately it flashed to it. You know, it was quick, right? It's the timing for the comedy. The the audience lost it, and I couldn't hear the definition. Wow, like <laughs> that's that, great. The, the catch, <laughs> like it was that big, and I now I saw the midnight show. Uh, on Thursday night, so oh. said, these were like these were like the hardcore people, you know, who came out to make sure that they saw it. So that there might have been some forgiveness from the crowd there, but they were super animated, and it was like, let's go! I loved it, and what a testament to how much of a difference that can make for comedy in a totally. theater, oh, yeah. in a group, in a yeah. group setting. That's great. Okay, yeah. good. Are there any other performances that you guys want to point to in terms of actors and actresses? Dan Gurira uh, from uh, Walking Dead, Michonne from Walking Dead. She she's so so amazing she played she was Okoye, my favorite the, probably the military the yeah yeah uh she just she was she was amazing and uh i loved so much that they didn't that that her political arc like her political narrative was to honor and loyalty to the throne and when the throne was seated with a maniacal power she maintained loyalty to the throne and i think that makes her just a ridiculously complex character and is is probably the central reason right now i want to see it again uh, like immediately because i think that speaks such volumes to what the film is is sort of trying to say politically i thought she was amazing oh yeah and then you've got the her showdown with uh uh, Daniel with her Kalua. husband, Hus- right, her, her, right? Yeah, her, her love, her, her, right? Love, yeah, exactly. I mean, yes, where he's, you know, she's going to pick her country, her nation over him. Um, I mean, it's just, yeah. It's and then a, he it, takes a knee. Oh, yes. Steve, that was so gorgeous. Yes, beautiful. Well, and now you know, Tommy talked about earlier that it's not quite on the nose, and that's kind of the beauty of these metaphors for the political s- situation that we have, but kind of the special part of that is that the nuances are very real they're not on the nose but these are the kind of political debates that we're getting stuck in in our minds are the the people who are potentially serving the country and that don't want to or vice versa who are trying to rise up these are the it's without pointing it out and saying this is exactly what's happening it's the internal struggles that people are feeling on a daily basis with everything that's going on it's not the sort of black and white argument that the media is portraying it's the nuance that everybody's trying to struggle with right now when they have difficulty accepting what's going on in the political realm right now i think that's that's what makes this story and these characters really special very well said very well said i i was trying to figure out what genre marvel was playing this as because it, at first i thought after we get to Wakanda and we get the whole like walking through the lab. Here's all your gadgets. And then we go to the casino. I'm like, Oh, this is going to be like a James Bond type of thing. But no, then it turns into like Shakespearean level, like royalty, you know, national drama, which I thrilled because I did not need another James Bond movie just with Marvel superheroes. I, I love that going through the lab, seeing all the gadgets, but it was like once we got beyond that, the scope of this just, as we've talked about, just became so deep and rich that I hope, you know, Marvel continues to push and explore different types of genres in its storytelling with as it introduces new heroes and gets, you know, we get into the different phases that we move beyond you know, the, the stories that we've already had, you know, we don't need more Iron Man and Captain America. We've got so many more characters with so much, such a rich variety of types of stories that can be told. I'm really looking forward to where Marvel continues to take this. Like how Captain America, the first one was more of a Cold War thriller. Yes. The, the, kind of a thing. Yes. I'm very interested in that. I'm interested in anything that isn't the first Thor. Yes. <laughs> That's the worst yeah. of the worst for me. That might as be Pandora taking place on Hobbit land. Yeah. But all of these other things are more interesting. To me. Agreed. We also talked about how much we like the music in this thing. I, I can't express enough how powerful the music cues were for me in the movie. I think my favorite, uh, some of my favorite music happened in the quiet moments. Like we're talking about one of the moments that I loved is when, uh, mom and sis were escaping and everything was played with this vibraphone thing that I just have not heard, but it, it made me sit up and pay attention throughout the film. Which one is the, which, which sequence and what is a vibraphone? 
And what is music? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. What is a which vibraphone <laughs> is like is is like a xylophone that's made of uh that's made of like thick metal. It's made so out of vibranium. It, oh, did it it's sound of a kind of one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did it kind of sound like percussion? Yes, that's correct. And um and that you know, I I loved it all the way through the movie and then when I'm sitting through the credits and listening and waiting for the big cut scene at the end, you hear all the different sort of iterations and the different things that they added to this film, all the different instrumentation, all the different kinds of music that they had in this and it was loaded with super interesting, super special music that I just haven't heard in a Marvel movie before. It it blew me away. I I really think this movie it, I want the soundtrack I, 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 this is the first time I've walked out of a Marvel movies and, and said, I want to buy the soundtrack. Ludwig Goranz did, uh, did the music for Creed, Fruitvale Station, Black Panther, and Get Out. Like, those are his top. He's, uh, he's, he's got 52 he's credits. He's a Ryan but, Coogler guy, is uh, what that means. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so, I, you know, those are all fantastic, fantastic scores. Uh, you know, also up with uh, Death Wish. Uh, he's, he did the, the remake of Death Wish. So, and he, I, thought, I think that's interesting. Yeah, for me, uh, definitely, this was the, one of the first times in the Marvel movies that I really noticed the music in a good way versus just sort of, oh, I'm feeling triumphant or excited, but really felt, I mean, the, the use of percussion, percussion is my favorite personal instrument and just to have everything drop off and just have percussion sort of, uh, key certain scenes and stuff. I thought it was fantastic. I loved it. My two favorite things about the movie were the aesthetic and the music. So we already talked about our theater experiences. One of the interesting things that I do find is that on Rotten Tomatoes right now, it's showing up as a 97% for critics, wow. 97% fresh for critics, which is amazing. But the audience is coming in at 74%. What do you think that uh, chasm is all about? I don't know. Maybe it's Tommy's thesis. I think it's too much hype. Yeah. So people are so there's haters coming out to drive it down. I don't think haters. I I don't oh, think I don't yeah, think you're necessarily yeah. a hater if you were uh Unoverwhelmed, unoverwhelmed. What's a what's a real word sure. for that? Underwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, I, there is there, there is, is already a word, a word for that. There yeah. is a word for that. Um, yeah. it's opposite overwhelm. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I think if you accidentally come in as underwhelmed for that, I mean, well, there, there's yeah. that. Then there's the whole political. Political. I mean, there's you can go. I think it was BuzzFeed, and I think we talked about this briefly on the sat mat this morning. I don't remember if it made it the show or not, but there's a whole bunch of like, you know, fake tweets out there about, you know, people being, you know, white people being attacked oh, that's by so the African-American audience. And so there's, there's oh, a lot what? of, it's when you've so got, dumb. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, it's, ridiculous. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yes. But you've got a lot of people that have specific uh, belief systems in this country that will not be fans of a, a film that features primarily an African-American audience. Unfortunately, that's terrible. In 2018, this is still an issue. So, well, to fly in the face of that, it's good to note that Variety is saying that this movie is going to shatter box office records for February. Oh, yeah. they're saying that it's going to be upwards of about 200 million. And similar to what you're talking about, Steve, they also noted that uh, a lot of times there's this sort of prevailing belief that uh, that a black culture based movie cannot cannot perform on the international stage international support for this movie has been through the roof as well this movie is going to transcend a lot and it's going to bring a lot of firsts uh in film and in the marvel yeah. universe uh to 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 the box office everywhere so um it, if nothing else maybe the dollar is going to turn people's minds around about that i really hope it does <laughs> It's Black Panther Flick Chart time. <laughs> Check out www.flickchart.com to try out what we're going to do here. The site provides a fun way to look at the movies that you've seen by creating a tournament style stack ranking system that organizes your personal preferences in a wacky and interesting way. The movies that we've talked about on this show can be seen ranked at flickchart.com slash TNR film board. All right. Who's got the keys to the castle? What's first? Up uh, first, we have Black Panther up against uh, everybody's favorite side effects. And when I say everybody's favorite, I mean, not mine. Black Panther for me. Side effects. Black Panther. I'm going to say Black Panther, but only because I don't want to play rock, paper, scissors. Oh, I'll take it, but don't give up so easy. <laughs> I have voted for side effects so much. I wonder if I rewatch it and it'd be like rewatching Crash. Would you yeah. be like, oh no, <laughs> what have I done? I thought this was a great movie and it's what's, it's a garbage film. Okay, go ahead. Next up, we have Black Panther versus Demolition. Demolition. Oh, the Jake Gyllenhaal? Jake Gyllenhaal. Uh, Demolition yes. for me. Uh, I'm going to go with Black Panther. I'm going to go with Black Panther too. 
Ah, I should have held my because it's a Shakespearean epic mm-hmm. story, is what it is. Okay, mm-hmm. Tommy and Pete do uh, do rock paper scissors. Here we go. One, two, three. Paper, paper. rock paper. <laughs> See, I'm the one who broke it. <laughs> well, that couldn't have been shadier. <laughs> I'm putting Mueller on your case. That was some <laughs> that was some collusion nonsense, but I'll let it go. Oh, this is the this is the first uh, really. I'm going to go ahead and take that win, even though I also take think it. that there was some collusion. Uh, but it, it, Black Panther versus Get Out. Mm. Ooh. Ooh, Get Out with a heart yeah. beat and a yeah, bullet get and out. a bullet. Get Out for me. By that heartbeat. Oh, sure. Uh, Black Panther versus The Martian. The Martian. The Martian. Yeah, Martian. Well, it's The Martian. Uh, Black Panther uh, versus Man from Uncle. I'm Black Panther on this one. I'm Man from Uncle. I'm going to say the Man from Uncle. I'll say Black Panther. Okay, Steve, let's do it. <laughs> JJ, conscious versus time. One, two, three, scissors. Rock. All right, so does that mean Black Panther uh, won? No, that means Man from Uncle. Man from Uncle won. All right, man. How about Black Panther versus Rogue One? Black Panther. Oh, that's the beach. That's the beach scene. Yes, that's the beach scene. Yeah, I ha- scene. I didn't like anything except for the battle on the beach scene. Right. Okay. Black Panther. Black Panther. Congratulations, everybody. Flick chart oh. wishes us a hearty congratulations. Black Panther is number fifteen oh, on our flick good. chart. That puts it right between the Man from Uncle and Rogue One. Uh, I will say that, uh, it, it, interestingly, up ahead of it, let's just look at some of the ones that won. Blade Runner 2049 is still number one. So we have Blade Runner, Star Wars The Last Jedi, Star Wars The Force Awakens, Logan, Gravity, Edge of Tomorrow, Molly's Game, Kingsman, The Secret Service, Get Out, Split, Guardians of the Galaxy, The Martian, Doctor Strange, Uncle, and Black Panther. So um, I, Sounds about I, right. I think that's a pretty legit placement. I don't think I would rank it higher than uh, uh, than anything else other than Man from Uncle. I agree. I agree. And for my uh, letterbox ranking, I I was going back and forth between three three and a half and four. I think I think it deserves a four star ranking here because it's so special in those quiet moments. So I'm going to give it four with a like. I'm a four with a like too. As am I. Four with a like. Three with a like. Well, the math is three point seven five with a like uh, and a heart. Uh, and so that makes it, uh, I don't know, can I do three point? I don't think I could do 3.75, Tom, breaking math. Then I bring it down to a two. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to happen. No, nope, oh. no, it's too late. So that that actually, may, I think we, we, I think the rule is, and I forget the rule every time I need to call on the rule, I think it's we round up. Uh, yeah. So yes. it rounds up to a four with a like. And uh, that is uh, awesome. So there we go. Four with a like, Letterboxd. Where do we go from here next month in March? And way at the end of March, I think it's the last weekend in March, is one that we have been talking a lot about on our Discord. That's Ready Player One. Woo! I'm excited about this one. And I am crazy excited to see that movie. Has everybody here read the book? Yes. Yes. I don't think that matters based on the trailer that I saw before Black Panther because I saw lots of stuff that I said... That's not even in the book. They're changing lots of stuff. I'm very much looking forward to this because on the rereading the book, I have some issues and I think they may have fixed some some story moments to make it a lot more entertaining. Palatable. Yes. Yeah. Well, and hopefully it translates to film the right way, because I think that that book, I think the book has a lot of difficulties for that. I think I, I think it's interesting because I think that no matter who's on the show with us, I think we've all have read the book. I think this is a first Definitely a first for since I've been on the film board where we've all read the book. Um, it might be a first in the history of the next reel, Pete. Well, there are, well, there are certainly books that uh, Andy and I have both read and talked about the movie. Oh, you guys. I, I can't think yeah. of one off the top of my head. But it's, well, you it, guys it have a, a smaller there. pool to work with. Yeah. It's just the two of you. So what yeah. are you guys doing on the weekly show right now? Musicals, right? Uh, musicals specifically of the 60s. We just finished cool. our uh, our uh, conversation about uh, Thoroughly Modern Millie. And we're thoroughly going Modern into... Millie. <laughs> That's exactly how it goes. And uh, we're going into <laughs> Babs, uh, Funny Girl, this week, which is, is oh. just such a fantastically wonderful soundtrack so, uh, or score and, and wonderful music. So it'll be fun to, to revisit Barbara Streisand uh, in, in her youth in this movie. Very cool. So we're looking forward to all that going forward. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. It's been a great show. Take it easy, Steve Sarmento. Always a great pleasure speaking with you guys. Enjoy your weekend, Tommy Handsome. Thank you guys so much. I love you. (laughs) Uh, We'll see you soon, Pete Wright. I love all of you, too. Violent agreement. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) 
Thanks, everyone, for listening. And please send us comments and questions about the show on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And consider rating us on iTunes because that helps us pop up more frequently on the feeds over there. Also, for as little as just $1 a month, you could support us at only as little as $1. I, I think you need a hype man for this part. $1 a month. What are you going to spend it on? Sandwiches? Some sort of a public radio sponsorship? No. Yeah. You know who doesn't need your help? Reply all. You know who doesn't need your help? (laughs) Ira Glass. We need your help. Let's just say, if you were a subscriber right now, if you were a a supporter of this show on Patreon, you could be listening to this gold, this podcast gold live as we record it. That's right. It's open. The live show is open in our Discord if if you were a Patreon subscriber. There you go. See, that's pretty cool. And if you give as little as $1 a month, we will personally... Uh, introduce you to Ira Glass. JJ, go ahead. <laughs> Footnote, we don't know Ira Glass. <laughs> Regardless, we would love it if you supported us, but we so appreciate your ears and hearts. So connect with us in any way you can, because at the next reel, when the movie ends, our conversation begins. Till next. This Ira Glass thing is going to be awkward for everybody. <laughs> Ira, not now. Ira, we're finishing the show. I'll call you in a bit. Hold on, Ira. All right. So, Pete, I want you to talk about the post-credit thing because it sounds like from our conversation, you understand it a little bit more than 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 I do. Um, what 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 did you see there? What came out in the post-credit scene? Okay, well, uh, I I actually am thinking about the second post-credit scene, and now suddenly I can't even remember what the first po- post-credit scene was. The first post-credit scene is the UN scene where, which I think is a great speech oh, that yeah. I just want lifted, where he talks about, and I found it actually. Somebody posted, it's Wakanda will no longer watch from the shadows. We cannot, we must not. We will work to be an example of how we as brothers and sisters on this earth should treat each other. Now, more than ever, the illusions of division threaten our very existence. We all know the truth. More connects us than separates us. But in times of crisis, the wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. We must find a way to look after one another as if we were one single tribe. Wow, yeah, that was great. I will vote yeah, for that's, him. That's I brilliant. will vote yeah. for him for president. That's, that's exactly. Thank you, Ryan Coogler. Uh, I, I thought that was brilliant, and <laughs> and I think totally. Uh, you know, you talk about just sort of an on the nose message. That that is the the period at the end of the political narrative. Uh, exactly. And uh, yeah. yeah. So the second one, though, at the Tommy, you stayed for that one, though, right? Are we talking to me? I stayed for none of them. Oh, you stayed for none. I of them. Okay. had to go. Okay, you didn't see that one even. But you you had referenced that action magic sand credits were going yes that you left I loved I loved all of that you left during the magic sand credits okay all of the magic sand stuff was beautiful the the interstitial in the in the movie and the closing credits were gorgeous I loved the beginning the whole beginning um, exposition part of that was great when they had people coming out of their hands and talking to them I thought that looked dumb oh yeah I personally thought that that was was so gross and weird I really loved when they have the little demo he's like he's looking at the convoy in oh, oh i like that, that. that and he fun. picks up the car that was so cool uh anyhow the post credit sequence that i i'm most interested in is is the one that actually changes the narrative of bucky barnes i was always under the assumption that bucky barnes who is the winter soldier tommy was going to be the next captain america that when um you know uh when our captain america chris uh, what's his name Chris Evans, Steve Chris Rogers, Evans, Hem- Chris Hemsworth, Evans, Steve Rogers. Neeson. No, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought when he leaves, Chris America, uh, that that Bucky Barnes was, and and I think JJ, this is right, right? He takes up the mantle of uh, of Captain America in oh. the books, right? I mean, isn't 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 that part of the the narrative? Yes, yeah. but there's but there's been many Captain Americas other than Steve. So yes, he was at one time. Bucky was at one time Captain America. There is this other character uh, in um, in the Wakanda narrative, right? In the Black Panther narrative, uh, the a young boy named Hunter uh, and his family crash in Wakanda, and the parents are killed. And it's a young white boy, and the boy is taken in by Wakanda, uh, the the people of Wakanda, and they raise him, and he is trained and. 
and he is given all of the great gifts of Wakanda as a as a native son, uh, and he becomes uh, it, it essentially a a, a sp- kind of a spy i i really thought that in this movie they were actually going to take us down the the direction of of hunter's story with killmonger right it's 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 very much a um he's he's a warrior he's raised as sort of a warrior prince i think and he is he's given all of the the trappings uh and gear and he be, takes on the mantle of the white wolf and he becomes sort of a spy for wakanda the white wolf and um, uh, Black Panther aren't buddies, but they have a collegial relationship with one another. And th- it, that is sort of an important thing. Well, now we have this final closing sequence. Um, we are introduced to, uh, you know, the, the sister is there and Bucky Barnes and they're on the edge of this, this, uh, lake. Bucky comes out of a hut. He is clearly now, um, uh, no longer in, uh, stasis. His, she has found a way using Wakandan technology to fix his brain so that he can't be triggered and created into and, and turned into a, you know, mindless super soldier as he had been. Who's she? Little sister? Yes. Little sister. And, and he still has no arm because you remember his arm got got blown off, right? Or, or taken off. And so now we have him in this position of being in Wakanda. We're pretty sure he's going to get that replacement arm where if he gets a replacement arm in Wakanda, it's going to be vibranium. And she calls him White Wolf uh, at the end of this sequence as she says, you know, come on, White Wolf, let's go. Which is Let's huge. go, you know, have uh, play Pinochle. I don't remember what the exact line is, but she she kind of <laughs> takes him into the next thing. That I feel like is a big deal because it potentially changes the trajectory of Bucky Barnes in this thing. Uh, and makes him and that's and, one thing right so it changes the, the the trajectory of the story it also changes the trajectory of the focus of the marvel universe going into the next phase because you could imagine that maybe bucky is going to be cap right so then you're going to get more captain america movies but this sets up for phase four or phase whatever they're calling it post phase three this sets up black panther 2 i wasn't even aware actually of the white white wolf character so how amazing is that to all of a sudden have a crossover from one of the other properties become this integral story that's part of the Black Panther lore. I think that's great. I do too. This is a, a post credit sequence that actually has some weight to it. And uh, and as you say, I mean, there were so many things in this particular movie that changed direction, right? Ulysses Claw dies. You know, that, that changes the direction because he had uh, an effect from other movies in this universe. We have, uh, you know, Martin Freeman has an increasing role. He's going to be in, he's in other movies. Uh, and now we have this change of direction for Bucky Barnes and I, I'm, I think it's something to watch. So I'm, I, I thought it was actually really cool, cool and smart. I agree. In the next Jurassic Park movie, do you think the baby Triceratops is going to come back? 